welcome to everyone for sticking around for a long afternoon, but very informative afternoon of presentations. I'm going to be presenting work that's joint with uh, Giancarlo Corsetti, who I believe is also on um, listening in somewhere, as well as Lou Hahn, um, who was a postdoc funded by the Keynes Fund, which was allowing us to conduct this research. Lou has gone on and is now an assistant professor at Liverpool. So this paper is called Invoicing and the Dynamics of Pricing to Market. And what we're doing is we're looking at evidence from UK export prices around the Brexit referendum. And so uh, very briefly, the data in this project is um, confidential administrative tax records from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and they don't um, endorse this work in any way. So broadly, the extent to which import and export prices respond to exchange rate movements is one of the, the key questions in international macro, and that's because it helps us understand and define the extent of the transmission of shocks from one country to another, as well as it plays an important role in helping governments design stabilization policies in the face of external shocks. Now, Recent studies have found that when we look at aggregate level data, so data at the level of a country, we have observed that the currency of invoicing is correlated with the extent of exchange rate pass through into import prices. So how much import prices change when there's some type of shock that causes the exchange rate to move is associated with the actual currency in which the transactions were, um, their contracts were invoiced. And so um, most notably, in a 2015 presentation of the Jackson Hole Symposium, Gita Gopinath emphasized that the systematic asymmetries that we observe in exchange rate pass-through around the globe was tightly tied to the widespread practice of using the U.S. dollar to invoice many transactions in different countries. And so what we're doing in this paper is we're trying to understand at a deeper level, what can we learn about the structure of the international pricing system by looking at very detailed granular data on the use of different invoicing currencies for transactions, international transactions conducted by British exporters. And so we have essentially three groups of questions that we're going to be looking at in this paper. And so the first one is just understanding what firms do. So how do firms manage their invoicing currencies? Do they use one currency or more than one currencies? Does their use of invoicing currencies change over time? Our second question relates to um, this broader question of, is there a correlation between the invoicing currency that a firm chooses for its transactions and the extent to which prices respond to exchange, to exchange rate movements. So is there a correlation between the selected invoicing currency and exchange rate pass-through in individual transactions data? And if there is, at what time frequency do we see significant correlations? And then the final question we turn to is we can think of any price as comprised of both uh, marginal cost of production, as well as a markup over the marginal cost of production that the firm retains. And so our final question that we ask is, is there a systematic or strategic relationship between the invoicing currency that a firm chooses and the way in which a firm adjusts it mar its markups in response to exchange rate movements? So more briefly, is there a relationship between the invoicing currency choice for international transactions whether or not a firm is pricing to market in its foreign sales. So skip over that. So just to lay out um, definitions. So in this paper, very simply, we can define any price change for an international transaction. And we're gonna be looking at the export of goods from Britain to other countries. A price change would consist of a change in marginal costs, such as wages or imported inputs from foreign countries. That would be component C a common or global markup over that marginal cost, which could change over time, and that's component A, as well as a destination specific change in the markup. So for example, we have in mind that um, in response to some exchange rate change, a British exporter might raise its markup on sales to Canada by 20%, 
but leave its markup on sales to Mexico unchanged. And in that case, we would see a destination specific adjustment of the markup in Canada. So classic studies of exchange rate pass through jointly estimate as one combined unit changes in A, B, and C. Um, what we're interested in is, is redoing that estimation. And then we're also going to hone in and focus on this middle component, this destination specific markup change. To do that, we're going to use an estimator we developed in a related project called the Trade Pattern Sequential Fixed Effects Estimator. And this essentially allows us to control for time varying unobserved changes in marginal costs, as well as changes in the global markup. And that way we can tease out how much the price changes in individual countries are moving. Okay, so just to get, um, I've been talking about invoicing currency more precisely, what does that mean? The data we're gonna be using is the universe of UK export transactions from 2010 to 2017. This includes sales to outside the EU as well as to the individual EU member states. Since 2010, this data set records the invoicing currency of every transaction. So these can be daily frequency data, um, unless it's sold to the EU. In that case, we don't know the currency of um, invoicing. Now, what we'll do is for every firm, product, destination, and time period that we have in our data set, we're going to categorize that transaction according to whether it was invoiced in pound sterling, in which case we'll call it producer currency invoicing whether it was invoiced in the local currency unit of the destination, so for example, Canadian dollars on sales going to Canada, or whether it was invoiced in an international vehicle currency. So for example, this would be the US dollar used on a sale to Mexico, or say um, the Euro used on sales to Cote d'Ivoire. Now, um, in limited time, I'm gonna go very quickly. Um, our first question was just asking, well, what the heck do UK firms do in terms of their choices about invoicing currency? So we identify um, three interesting and novel facts and then we um, validate um, previously known information. So the first thing is UK trade is dominated by firms that use at least two currencies. So if we look at all export value from out going to outside the EU, so the US, you know, Africa, wherever, 99% of UK export value in to extra EU destinations originates from British firms that use at least two currencies to invoice their sales. So they might be using one currency for one country, another currency for another country, but these firms are sophisticated. They're using at least two currencies. The second fact we find is actually more fascinating in some ways. What we observe is that we look at a firm and we look at the product within the firm and we look at a one year time horizon and we count how many different currencies does a firm use for selling the same product within a destination within one calendar year. And so what we find is roughly 50% of export value from the UK going to places outside the EU um, is conducted by firms that are using two or more currencies for selling the same product in the same destination. So this could be, we don't know, it could be to two different customers, um, it could be two different times of the year, but so one sale would be, for example, in Mexico, it would be invoiced in pound sterling, and a later one would be in Mexican peso, or it could even be on the same day, um, but two different customers. Um, the third thing is we observe if we look at UK firms that only use one currency for an entire calendar year, we look at how frequently do these firms switch from one year to the next in terms of the invoicing currency they use, and um, we've basically establish the transition matrix. To give you one brief example, if we look at firms that are invoicing in, the ve in vehicle currencies, say US dollar, we find that 20% of firms invoicing in vehicle currencies in year T have switched into producer currency invoicing, so pound sterling for their sales in year T plus one. And then our fourth fact is that we validate um, the aggregate shares of the different currencies over uh, eight years. They're quite stable for the UK. We see um, roughly 60% of UK export value is going in sterling. A third is invoiced in a major currency like the dollar or euro and about 5% um, local currency invoice transactions. Now I'm gonna skip through a number of tables because um, I wanna try to get through a lot of material from this study. So the next thing was our, our next question 
was what to, to what extent is there correlation between the currency selected for invoicing and the extent of exchange rate pass through and to look at this question we're going to use the unique experience in britain that at the time of the brexit referendum there was a sizable depreciation in the value of the pound sterling against major currencies so what we do is we look at immediately around that time how much is the average price of a good exported out of Britain invoiced in different currencies changed in the weeks after the major depreciation. So broadly, what we find is that for those transactions that were invoiced in sterling, their price doesn't change a whole heck of a lot. It's quite stable in the weeks after the, ref uh, the depreciation. But for those transactions that were invoiced in vehicle currency or local currency of the destination, the price changes quite dramatically. However, over a longer time horizon, a year and a half after the Brexit depreciation, we basically find that all three currencies um, have come to align with the weaker value of the pound. And so I'll just jump ahead to show you some graphs and what I mean by that precisely. So here what we have is um, three years of weekly data for UK export prices for those goods that had their transaction invoiced in pound sterling. We've stripped out the average price of the good according to the firm, the product, and the destination it was going to. And what we're left with is just the average change over time for those transactions that were invoiced in sterling. The red line represents the value of the pound sterling. The sharp increase is the depreciation or the weakening of the sterling after the Brexit vote. And the blue line is the average price of a sterling invoiced transaction in sterling. So what you see is basically right after the the depreciation, there's more or less no change in the average sterling price. So what we have is on impact, basically 100% of the exchange rate movement is passed into changes in the local price in the destination. So for an importer, there's essentially 100% exchange rate pass through on impact, which gradually the sterling price creeps up. So by the end of this 18 month period, we basically have zero pass through um, into the, the, the price and the destination. Now, this is quite different if we look at those transactions that were invoiced in the local currency of the destination. So what we see here is that on impact, right at the time of the depreciation, there's a big change when we look at the sterling price of a good whose transaction was invoiced in local currency and you can see that really by six weeks, it's lined up perfectly with the value of the currency. We know from some of our other work that at around 36 weeks after the depreciation, the higher price of, of imports coming into the UK had basically fully passed through. So for any British uh, manufacturer that was using imported inputs that had been fully priced in by about 36 weeks, what you can see here is actually after that period of time, we see that the, the sterling price of those goods that were invoiced in local currency continues to creep up. So, you know, what this means is that the UK export price in the destination actually rose in local currency terms. There's a little bit of an overshooting here. Um, and so this suggests maybe what was going on is firms that were invoicing in local currency passed through their increased cost, but then they also kept stable the markup in the destination. So they, they kept that markup there. Now, um, the, and with dollar invoice transactions, we see something very similar. Now, um, I know that uh, their time is short and it's the end of the long day. So I'll quickly just try to give you a sense of what we did in estimating destination specific markup adjustments. So I showed you this slide earlier, decomposing prices into three components. And so, Basically, what we have is when firms are engaged in exporting, they have highly fra you know, fragmented trade patterns in the following sense. This graphic here gives you a sort of stylized typical trade pattern of a firm selling a product. In the first period, it sells to two countries, countries A and B. In the second period, some change in the economic environment has caused the firm to exit market B, but enter and begin selling in country C. Country period three, we see more changes. So the firm has now added two further destinations, country B and D. Something happens in period four, it's exited country B and D. And in period five, they've re-entered countries uh, B and D. 
So the basic insight of our analysis of destination specific markups is whereas traditional studies of pricing would look at changes in pricing only in country A and follow it over time, we're going to be looking at changes in prices in period two in countries A and C relative to what the price is in period four in countries A and C. So this allows us to difference out time varying changes that are common within a trade pattern, a set of destination countries, um, as well as common components of the, of the markup. And so what we show in some other work is that if the factors that determine a firm's selection into a set of destinations are relatively stable, then if we include this control for the firm's trade pattern, it allows us to um, control for selection bias associated with the problem that firms enter and exit from markets because of um, observable factors such as the exchange rate, as well as other unobservable factors. So I'm going to skip through um, the equations to summarize what our results are here. So the first um, set of results I have here looks at monthly data from 2010 to 2017. It's UK exports to all countries in the world except the EU member states. And what we see here is that against a 1% increase in the foreign currency of the destination, the UK export price in sterling rises by 35 hundredths of 1%. What this means for the importer on the other side of the transaction is that the essentially exchange rate pass through is incomplete. And so only, you know, so 65% of the exchange rate movement doesn't get priced in. So how can we understand and explain this incomplete pass through? So we look at the destination specific component of the markup and we see that the markup also increases by nine hundredths of 1% in response to a 1% increase in the foreign currency. So these two numbers together tell us that about a quarter of the incomplete pass through is due to the fact that the firm is specifically adjusting markups and destination different destinations differently. Now we then go forward and we look at we take this all data and we break it down into those transactions invoiced in sterling invoiced in vehicle currency and invoiced in the local currency of the destination. The big punchline what we observe here is that the price response in sterling of transactions invoiced in sterling or in a vehicle currency is kind of modest. It's um, 0.24, the elasticity is 0.24 for producer currency, 0.35 for vehicle currency. What this implies is a relatively high level of exchange rate pass through into import prices. In sharp contrast, when we look at local currency invoicing, the sterling price is quite responsive to exchange rate movements, meaning that the price in the local currency is not very responsive. So there's quite um, exchange rate pass through into import prices is much more modest. Now, we then look at the destination specific markup adjustments. And what we find here is essentially no statistically significant change in the markups for producer and vehicle currency, but a quite substantial adjustment in the markup of those transactions invoiced in the local currency of a destination. Okay, in terms of how much, how important are these local destination specific markup adjustments? Well, they explain about 70% of the incompleteness of exchange rate pass through. So to wrap it up, um, what did we learn in this presentation? I hope um, we have evidence in support of this idea of an international price system in which some firms are pricing to global factors, others are pricing to destination specific factors. But importantly, we find that firms select specific invoicing currencies in order to implement different types of pricing strategies. If you want a price to market, you use local currency of the destination. We also uh, discovered or identified that the lion's share of trade is conducted by firms that use multiple currencies. So the choice of the currency is a very active decision margin for the firms. In response to the depreciation after Brexit, we saw that local and vehicle currency invoice transactions demonstrate much more rapid price adjustment in sterling terms than producer currency invoice transactions. And finally, only local currency invoice transactions demonstrate destination specific markups. So if you want to price discriminate as a firm operating in international markets,
you're going to invoice um, your sales in the local currency of the destination. Thank you. Thank you.